All right, y'all, here's how to support the show. Uh, first of all, uh, sign up for the RSS feeds so that you don't miss a show. Um, LibertarianInstitute.org or ScottHorton.org for those. Also, subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. And um, sign up at Patreon. Anybody who donates a dollar or more per interview at Patreon.com, you get two free audio books, and that can be including my book, uh, narrated by me, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. So uh, help support that way. Sign up at Patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show. And um, uh, send in 50 bucks at ScottHorton.org slash donate. You get a signed copy of the uh, book Fool's Errand of the paperback there. And anybody who donates $100, uh, it used to be It Takes Two. Now for any donation of $100, you get a lifetime subscription to listen and think libertarian audiobooks. And there's already a whole bunch of them and there will be more. A uh, lifetime subscription for any $100 donation to The Scott Horton Show uh, from Listen and Think Audio. Uh, or you can get a silver QR code commodity disc, which is a really cool currency. Uh, silver, one ounce disc uh, with a QR code. Tells you the instant spot price on there. And um, just go to scotthorton.org slash donate. There's also a PayPal for single donations or you can sign up uh, to do monthly donations on PayPal as well. And um, take all different kinds of digital currencies, especially Zencash. Zensystem.io for Zencash. And of course all the different kinds of Bitcoins and etc. like that. Um, so check all that out at scotthorton.org slash donate. And hey, by the way, if you like this show, uh, review it for me on iTunes, Stitcher, etc. Uh, if you like the audio book, it's now available on iTunes as well as audible.com. So leave a good review on there if you like that and uh, help get that out. Thanks. Sorry, I'm late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing the great Gareth Porter, my very favorite reporter. Uh, he's also a historian, an investigative historian and journalist. He wrote Perils of Dominance, Imbalance of Power, and the Road to War in Vietnam. And he also wrote Manufactured Crisis, the Truth Behind the Iran Nuclear Scare. He writes regularly for Truth Out and for the American Conservative Magazine and for Consortium News.com. And we reprint all of it at antiwar.com original.antiwar.com slash porter. This one is called An Elite Coalition Emerges Against a Trump-Kim Agreement. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Gareth? I'm doing fine. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be back. Very happy to have you here. And uh, wow, what an interesting time. Donald Trump, he went through it, went to Singapore, made uh, struck up a personal relationship of a sort with the dictator of North Korea, and they signed a thing promising to move forward on denuclearization of the uh, Korean Peninsula. And the center right and the center left and the TV news in America, especially, went absolutely crazy over this. Uh, what's going on? What explains it? Well, you know, it seems to me uh, this this response, uh, the reaction to the Singapore uh summit meeting really reveals something uh, that, that was not quite as clear as it is now, which is that there is not just an anti-Trump uh, feeling on the part of the uh, news media and the Democratic Party, but there's something else at play here. There's a, there's a uh, way in which the 
anti-Trump uh, position of of the uh, mainstream media, particularly, of course, the partisan media, but not limited to that, has been now linked to and allied with a distinctly separate uh, issue, which is what about what happens if, in fact, Trump is able to actually reach an agreement with North Korea that sticks, uh, and uh, how does that how is that going to affect the future position of the United States as a power in East Asia, and and it's it's now occurring to a lot of people uh, who are not allies of of Trump that this could mean a very big change in the. Uh, regional politics and even global politics, because it would make it much more difficult for the United States to maintain or or even beef up its power position, quote unquote, in relation to China in particular. Mm -hmm. And and this has be, begun to uh, be expressed by some of the people who have uh, been critical of uh, uh, Trump's policy toward North Korea. Initially, of course, as you know, uh, the the uh, problem that was raised by critics, both uh, in the partisan media and in the more uh, established uh, print and uh, electronic media, was that Trump was proceeding on the basis of a false assumption, which was that North Korea would ever be willing to give up its nuclear weapons. Now, you know, that that was a way of, of basically uh, trying to ward off the possibility of a summit between Trump and Kim, trying to uh, to get uh, the, the White House to reassess uh, whether it was going to go ahead with it. And of course, they were working closely with John Bolton in that regard. One of the interesting things about the situation is how the press is clearly uh, aligning itself with Bolton's point of view. But now, you know, what we're getting is something that is beginning to worry about the possibility that he could succeed in this. And uh, so, so they're now primarily wringing their hands over the idea that Trump, or not the idea, but the fact that Trump uh, expressed uh, the, the readiness and has, has actually uh, acted on it to uh, stop temporarily, at least, the military. Uh, joint military operations or mil military exercises with South Korea. Uh, now, you know, this has become one of the flashpoints politically surrounding the issue of, of Trump's policy toward North Korea. And it's being presented by this uh, coalition of, of uh, mainstream media, uh, Democratic critics, and, uh, and I would add the foreign policy elite, the foreign policy establishment generally part of it. Uh, what they're saying now is that uh, that uh, Trump is uh, is actually endangering a 70 year old alliance with South Korea and that therefore he is really uh, endangering the security of the United States. That's the implication of what the uh, critics of Trump are saying now about his policy. Uh, and to my way of thinking, this is uh, the beginning of a new stage where uh, I think there's a, a coalition that is forming. It's, it's a very loose coalition. It's not formalized, obviously. It's maybe not even conscious. But I think a lot of people are beginning uh, to, to believe that they have to uh, oppose Trump to make sure, to, to oppose his policy toward North Korea, to, to make sure that he doesn't make it impossible for the United States to carry out the strategy of uh, really competing with China much more vigorously than has been the case in uh, the past because he is uh, making peace on the Korean Peninsula. Hmm. All right. So well, there's so much here. But first of all, uh, I had a clue that some of the arguments here were disingenuous when they all kept repeating themselves that we are abandoning South Korea here. When this entire effort has been led by the South Korean President Moon, and Trump has basically told him, yes, go ahead, I won't stand in the way of you moving this thing forward. And then Moon came to him and said, listen, we've made substantial progress, we're ready for you now. And so talk a little bit about, because there are important talking points beyond just, you know, 
uh, we must hate Trump even more than peace deals, uh, which is a major part of just the the frame of reference for all of this stuff. Um, but uh, some of the important talking points, Gareth, are that we got nothing for this. Trump says not only is he calling off the exercises, which I guess are a given good, uh, but he even went so far as to adopt the language of the enemy and say that they're provocative. And yeah, so, was- and he did that and he got nothing for it. And he just bestowed the benevolent legitimacy of the United States and its red, white, and blue flag onto this merciless dictator. And, and Kim just completely played Trump like a fool because all Trump is, is a TV actor at the end of the day. That's what they say, Gareth. That, of course, is a repeat of, of the theme that began many, uh, many weeks ago that, uh, uh, that Kim and, and the North Koreans would simply play Trump. Uh, they're clever. They will make promises, but they won't keep them. And they'll pocket all kinds of concessions and he'll never get anything in return. And, and you're right. I mean, the, the, the uh, prize uh, argument that, uh, that the critics have come out with uh, over and over again in various media is that Trump uh, actually uh, internalized the rhetoric of or the argument of the North Koreans, of the adversary. And this was such a, a, a damning, such a shocking idea that, the, that a lot of people thought they really would be able to uh, show that, that, that uh, Trump is on the wrong, on the wrong road here and uh, be able to push back in an effective way. Now, what you've said is absolutely right, that the South Korean government, Moon Jae-in, uh, has all along championed the idea of, uh, at the very least, toning down these military uh, drills between the United States and South Korea, because in the past they have involved, uh, and, and by the past I mean even as of last year and early this year, they involved B-52s um, uh, carrying uh, weapons, uh, sorry, B-52s capable of carrying weapons, that were uh, flying over uh, South Korea. They involved uh, the idea of practicing decapitation strikes against North Korea. Somehow, uh, this was all reported in the Japanese press and the South Korean press. So uh, the idea that Trump was uh, merely, you know, sort of repeating or internalizing North Korean propaganda about U.S. Uh, and and South Korean uh, drills. Politi- uh, military games, rather than uh, actually reflecting the reality that even President Moon, or especially President Moon himself, has recognized and has sought to try to tone down, if not eliminate, uh, is is clearly disingenuous. And and what I found by going back into the historical record, moreover, is that Trump was actually reflecting the uh, point of view that was held by U.S. officials in South Korea, both uh, diplomatic and intelligence people, back in the late 80s and 90s, 1990s. Because uh, in a book by Leon Siegel called Disarming Strangers, which is the most authoritative book on the history of U.S. uh, uh, nuclear diplomacy with North Korea that has ever been written, uh, it is documented that the uh, then ambassador to South Korea, Donald Gregg, has actually was in favor of uh, actually t- terminating, uh, suspending those uh, military drills because they were so provocative to uh, North Korea, because the North Koreans were so freaked out about them that they were afraid that they would not be able to get the North Koreans to cooperate uh, in a north-south, uh, uh, you know, uh, peace p- process, nor uh, to be able to get the North Koreans to uh, go along with uh, the the effort by the United States to promote uh, a, a non-nuclear uh, uh, Korea. Mm-hmm. So, so there's a history here. And 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 by the way, James Clapper, who was later the uh, national the director of national intelligence. Uh, was earlier in his career a general who was in charge of U.S. intelligence in South Korea, basically in charge of intelligence for all of Korea. And he also uh, told uh, Leon Siegel 
uh, for his book that uh, that he found the North Korea. He knew the North Koreans would go nuts every time the U.S. had a, a joint military drill with South Korea because they were regarded uh, as as a threat to North Korea. They were they were really convinced that they might the United States might use this as an opportunity to attack the North. So so there is a long history here of U.S. officials uh, and intelligence uh, specialists on Korea knowing that these drills were, in fact, quite provocative to the North Koreans. So essentially what, what Trump was doing was simply recognizing a well-established fact. Now, how he arrived at that, I, I don't know for sure. But but what we can say for sure is that he was not merely internalizing North Korean propaganda. He had good reason for believing that. You know, there there is an awareness on the part of a lot of people, privately at the very least, people who are no longer, uh, you know, re, you know, have to to maintain the official line, shall we say, that that these drills uh, were not really uh, helping in in any situation where the United States wanted to have diplomatic progress, political progress that involved the North Koreans willingly coming along. It simply, they were incompatible with that. Mm. So now here's the thing of it, and you mentioned in here too, uh, to get back to the concessions real quick, that the biggest concessions from the North Koreans, and this is convenient for the media and uh, the national security elite who are upset about all this, they came before the big meeting. So Pompeo didn't get a big parade and, and didn't seek as much TV time and credit as Donald Trump, of course, uh, made a big deal about it when he showed up to accept what, you know, had already been worked out so far, basically. Um, but, you know, Trump could have emphasized that a little bit more, I guess, for PR's sake, that they did get real concessions here. And in this case, before he even arrived, because they wanted to be real sure that uh, it would not, you know, end up being an embarrassing meeting or whatever. That so they had Pompeo and and the North Koreans already worked this out beforehand. But so can you go into a little bit more detail about what those concessions were? Because it's a real powerful narrative that Trump got yeah. nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, this is and one by of the way, this is not. And I think people can tell and ought to know that neither of us are trump partisans anyway we are simply peace talk partisans uh both of us opponents of obama and also big boosters of his deal with iran for example yeah yeah well, ab absolutely i can i can say without any uh fear of of uh being uh inconsistent with my entire record of publishing that uh, i have no uh, regard for Trump as a human being or as a political leader, and, and I regard him as a disaster in many ways, uh, disaster for the United States. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, the uh, the idea that, that everything that Trump does must be automatically opposed begins to look uh, a little bit sketchy when we regard the uh, the North, the U.S. Uh, uh, North Korean relationship as a as a test of it. Mm. I mean, this is actually, you know, after Obama softened up with Cuba, this is the last front of the old Cold War. Now we have a new Cold War with Russia and with China, but that's different. This is the last Cold War. We ought to be able to go ahead and wrap this up now. I think. Absolutely. So, so let me come back to your your point or your question about the, the case that was made that Trump got nothing and Kim took away all of the winnings from, from the uh, Singapore summit. Uh, you know, this is an absolutely outrageous uh, misfeasance or malfeasance by the news media in pushing this line, because all they had to do was put together the knowledge of what uh, Pompeo has said publicly uh, the fact that he, you know, had this uh, mission to Pyongyang and and met personally with with Kim Jong Un and and uh, then met with his personal envoy to Washington uh, uh, had had I believe three meetings with with Kim and two meetings with I guess two meetings with Kim and three meetings with the envoy so a number of of uh, hours spent with the two of them and uh, and then. Within a couple of weeks, uh, I guess it was more like 10 days after his uh, originally secret trip to Pyongyang, uh, Kim Jong-un comes out with a, a major concession, which was to agree that North uh, Korea would end its uh, testing of both nuclear weapons and the ICBM uh, before any negotiations even begin. 
uh, without even having a uh, uh, an actual pledge from uh, Trump that there would be a summit, but on the hope that there would be. Uh, so obviously there was a connection there between the concession made by Kim Jong Un and the uh, the move toward the summit with Trump. And the the idea uh, that no one in the news media called attention to the connection between these two and su suggested or pretended there was no connection is is simply outrageous in my view. All right, hang on just one second. Hey guys, here's who sponsors this show. Mike Swanson and his great investment advice at wallstreetwindow.com. He's actually uh, posting some stuff at the Libertarian Institute website now. Really great stuff. The great Mike Swanson. And he's also the author of the book, The War State, which is a really great history of the rise of the new right military industrial complex after World War II in the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy eras. You'll really want to look at it. The War State by Mike Swanson. Also, Roberts and Roberts Brokerage. Inc. If you listen to Mike, you'll be buying some metals. You'll want to buy them from Roberts and Roberts. They've been around as long as I've been alive. They've got a great reputation. They take the very smallest premium possible in order to uh, help arrange the very best sales for you at uh, of uh, platinum, palladium, gold, silver, of course, and no premium at all if you buy with Bitcoin. They're at Roberts and Roberts. That's rrbi.co rrbi.co for your precious metals there as i mentioned before zen cash zensystem.io to learn all about this great new digital currency um, and which is also a secure messaging application and document transfer uh, device and all the rest there learn all about it at zensystem.io and read the book it's by hussein badak chani it's how to run your tech business like a libertarian that's not the title. The title is No Dev, No Ops, No IT. Those are all one word each, if you take my meaning. No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badakhchani. It's really great. And uh, check out LibertyStickers.com for all your anti-government propaganda. I made up most of them. And, uh, yeah, that didn't work out with the new website I kept promising you. But now, supposedly, someone else is promising one. So I guess we'll see if... We ever get a new website, but there's still a lot of great anti-government propaganda, and you could buy it at libertystickers.com. Now, one more thing. Check out scotthorton.org. We've been having some server problems, but otherwise, scotthorton.org is a great-looking new website, as you can tell. And if you want a good 2018 model website for your business or for whatever you're doing, your opinions, um, check out expanddesigns.com, the great Harley Abbott over there. And if you go to expanddesigns.com slash Scott, you'll save 500 bucks. Uh, what are the chances, do you think? that they can work out a deal where North Korea really gives up all their nukes and or all their long range rockets. Well, look, I mean, you know, you can't say anything for sure. And, and, you know, these negotiations are extremely tricky, very, uh, they involve a lot of uh, issues which have to be somehow uh, reconciled, uh, you know, des uh, desires or, or demands on both sides uh, that, that have to be reconciled. And it involves, uh, you know, a, a series of phases, um, and and no one can say for sure that they're going to be able to come out of this with an agreement. But I have to say that I feel that there's strong momentum here, and it res it reflects the desire of both sides to come up with an agreement, uh, the the conviction of both sides that it's in their interests, uh, because the uh, value of the uh, of that agreement for both sides would be much greater than what they give up, and and you your question about the North Koreans I think is is uh, one that um, is is certainly um, it, it's clearly relevant to to uh, understand that this uh, this is something that the North Koreans have wanted to do this this reaching an agreement with the United States is something that the North Koreans have wanted to do ever since Kim Il Sung was still alive. Uh, and, and why is this? Because the North Koreans have understood at some level that that they cannot be secure and they cannot be uh, they're not going to be able to feed their own people adequately and have a decent uh, uh, economy until they reach agreement with the United States, because the United States is going to be able to prevent them from achieving those goals. 
and that's the that's the very least. Of course, they, they're also afraid the United States might invade them and, and try to change the regime. So, so this has been a very strong motive for the North Korean regime for decades now, certainly going back to the 1970s. And by the way, uh, Scott, I was the first journalist, and I'm rather proud of this, I have to say. I was the first journalist to publish an article making a very detailed argument that the United States sh should negotiate an agreement with North Korea to ease tensions on the Korean Peninsula and uh, to try to move toward a more peaceful uh, uh, sort of a, a peaceful uh, situation uh, for Northeast Asia. Uh, that was in 1979 in Foreign Policy magazine. And uh, no, ever since then, uh, you know, it, it, you know, it's been decades that nobody else really in the media has made that uh, sort of argument. And, and uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the North Koreans have been highly motivated for a long time to do this. And Kim Jong Un, uh, specifically, we know there was there's a lot of uh, documentation based on their own published documents and meetings that the North Koreans had with uh, Americans who had been in the government and then were in private life in, in 2013 that indicate that uh, Kim Jong-un had a strategy to build up uh, his, his nuclear weapons capability and to reach toward having an ICBM capability in order to try to push the United States, at that point it was the Obama administration, to actually sit down and negotiate seriously with North Korea. And, uh, you know, they apparently uh, Kim Jong Un did hope that Obama would change his mind before the end of his administration. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, if he was, you know, he's going to be reelected. He was reelected in, in 2013 uh, in his second administration that he would, in fact, agree to negotiate. And they were disappointed about that. So when Trump was elected, um, the the uh, initial period, of course, was one of fire and fury. But when uh, the, the South Korean president, uh, Moon Jae-in, was able to get away with uh, reaching uh, a kind of uh, detente with North Korea, uh, then, you know, Kim Jong-un took advantage of that. And that brings us to this period of intense negotiation. So the answer to your question, uh, Scott, as far as I'm concerned, is that, yes, it, it can happen. He is willing to give up his nuclear weapons uh, in a situation where the United States takes a series of steps uh, politically that that uh, signal clearly to the North Koreans that the uh, United States is, is ready to give up its 70-year policy of overt and very aggressive hostility toward the North Korean regime. Mm. Now, that's a big if. That's a big if. And, and there's no uh, guarantee that the United States will, in fact, do that. There's no guarantee that Trump can get away with it. And that's one of the points that I make in my article, that, that there's a real danger that this uh, elite coalition of Democratic Party elected officials, the foreign policy establishment and the established media, establishment media will together be able to sabotage such an agreement by making it impossible to have a treaty. Mm -hmm. With between the United States and North Korea. And if that's the case, then I think that's going to be problematic for the North. All right. Now, so a big problem here is, well, first of all, as you said before, John Bolton, who has not moved to the left at all, uh, John Bolton is now representing the centrist establishment consensus here. And he tried to foil the thing. You wrote a different article about this previously that we talked about, uh, where he invoked the Libya model and the libya model being the one where you give up your centrifuges they didn't have nuclear weapons they had they had really traveled nowhere along the path to nuclear weapons in reality but anyway um they gave up their old junk they bought at aq Khan's garage sale and george bush promised not to kill him and then barack obama went ahead and killed him anyway and stabbed him in the back and john bolton brought that up and even white house officials complained to the media that that bolton was trying to sabotage them by invoking Libya and Gaddafi. Uh, but there is another example, and I don't know whether anybody's actually talked about this, but there's Kennedy's security guarantees to Cuba. And it seems like that might be the way to put it. That, And it seems like, best I can tell, it'll have to be a deal that big from the U.S. side that we will give you an ironclad 200-year, no matter what, 
Cuba level security guarantee that we will not attack you and regime change you and uh, have you bayoneted and shot in the head on the side of the road like what happened to Gaddafi. None of that is going to happen if you'll give up your nukes. And then that well, would have to be the deal, would be that big of a really a peace deal to end the old war from the 1950s and uh, opening of, of trade relations, a dropping of sanctions and a whole new kind of day here right which yeah, actually in a way the vagueness of the origin of their uh, document that they put out in a way um kind of it sort of left it open-ended too i think and where the handshake and the photo op itself like when nixon went to china and met with mao that that's really the most important thing and everything else after that is details details and we can work it out as long as we're really dropping the old cold war hostile posture as they call it well, you're right. I mean, the, the essence of the Trump-Kim summit was indeed to just reflect uh, the, the warmth, uh, relatively speaking, and between the two leaders and uh, the, the prospect for serious negotiation that that suggested. They weren't intending to uh, foreshadow the kind of deal that would be negotiated at all, even though, and I want to make this point clear, again, there were understandings between uh, Pompeo and uh, Kim, as well as his, uh, his envoy to Washington, that went well beyond what was in that, what was it, 348-word uh, 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 statement. That, that statement was simply a uh, boilerplate, basically agreed to before they arrived in Singapore. And they even in their negotiation, or I should say in their conversation, because it wasn't negotiation, in their conversation in Singapore, they came to further uh, understandings, obviously informal, not formalized, that went beyond what was in that statement, as uh, uh, Trump himself said. Uh, so so the idea that was reflected in the establishment media uh, coverage of the event, that, that this was a nothing burger uh, that it was therefore kind of a flop and uh, foreshadows uh, basically uh, United States not getting much in the negotiations is, is one of the worst uh, kinds of failures of, of the media that I can uh, re re recall in my 50 years of following international politics and, and negotiations in the, in the media. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, I'd like to say that um, you know, for myself anyway, I don't accept the premise that North Korea needs to give up all their nukes any more than I think everybody, all nations should give up all their nukes. And I do think that, uh, America is bound to do so in the NPT, but I'm framing this in terms of the goals and the lines drawn by the people involved, which is of course, as they may be over promised at the beginning, complete denuclearization. But I'm cool with just a handshake. I mean, I don't care if they give up. I mean, hey, what if they gave up half their nukes? Wouldn't that be fine? We don't have to go back to full Cold War posture there. We're still making progress, and we're still talking. Well, I think it's very difficult to cut the pie that way. I mean, I think it really has to be pretty much an all-or-nothing agreement uh, for, for obviously domestic politics in the United States uh, being the primary the primary reason, uh, let's face it. I mean, that's that's the... That's the major factor in determining whether there could be something less than total denuclearization. At this point, I can't see that that's it's a viable possibility that there could be anything but that. And again, I mean, you know, the the media portrayed this uh, as a question of North Korea uh, really having to uh, give up everything, and that that the North Koreans would never do that, uh, and that uh, well, he did I mean, the media tried to discredit every aspect of it for weeks and weeks, and the American people still supported it anyway. That's right. That's a very important point, Scott. I, I'm glad you brought that up, because some of the polling that has been published shows that the uh, public is way ahead of the media in terms of its understanding of this situation. Well, and this and is they, a, it's a very interesting example of the potential power of a guy like Donald Trump to do the right thing, where he's a right winger, he's got a right wing uh, cabinet, a military cabinet, basically in charge of everything. He could make peace wherever he wanted. He could go shake hands with the Ayatollah next. 
And they wouldn't be able, they can try, but they can't really hurt him the way they would hurt Barack Obama for daring to go to Tehran. But a Republican could do it, just like Nixon can go to China. And well, just I don't like- think it's quite the same, Scott. I mean, look, the, uh, the Democratic Party uh, has a, a big constituency, and they're pretty much united on this. And they have the power to make it much more difficult than it was for Nixon to go to China. I think there's a big difference there. Yeah, I but I think they could be defeated politically if they really tried to take them on that way. You know, well, Joe Loria had a piece about how the Democrats and the New York Times all congratulated Richard Nixon for shaking hands with Mao and said, you know, you had to be a pretty big man to do that. And congratulations. Good going. And let's move forward. And this and that. And if Trump wanted to really push a deal here, even if he did only get half a loaf and then but shame them for opposing it, I think it'd be all right. Well, let me let me go back to what I think a deal would have to be. Uh, I think in terms of the North Koreans, what it has to involve is an extended period in which the United States willingness to get rid of this uh, degree of hostility uh, and and outright, uh, how should I put it? I mean, just uh, you know, willful uh, readiness to threaten uh, North Korea constantly, uh, to treat them as a as, as a non uh, state, to treat to treat North Korea as something that is so hateful that we don't need to to pretend that it should be respected as anything but something that we're ready to remove. That has to change dramatically. And it has to change for a period of time. It has to change for a period of years. And I think that's the minimum that is required here. It means it means watching the United States undergo a very far-reaching political transformation in terms of its attitude. And again, I would just emphasize that there's no guarantee that that is achievable. I, I think no matter what Trump wants to do, there's going to be pushback, and it's going to be a very tough uh, row to hoe to get the coalition, which now I, I'm seeing uh, forming informally here, uh, to recognize that they would endanger the possibility of peace on the Korean Peninsula and that they would be the bad guys in the history of this uh, of this episode. Uh, I hope that that it will uh, move that way, that it, that it will turn out in that uh, uh, direction. But I am afraid that that this uh, this set of attitudes that we're seeing reflected in the media coverage uh, is is so long in formation and so fundamental in terms of the political culture of this country that that we're in real trouble over this. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'm sure you noticed the headline in USA Today, and I'm not sure if they were being cheeky about this or if they were just saying, hey, look, defense stocks plummet as Donald Trump successfully meets with Kim Jong-un and moves forward on a peace deal here. And then you have these quotes in your article. Again, the article is called an elite coalition emerges against a Trump-Kim agreement. And you have Fareed Zachariah and Ian Bremmer and others explaining that this hurts America's position of dominance in East Asia. And my favorite quote here is Fareed Zachariah. I'll have to click the link and watch the video. Um, <laughs> where, And this is the man who in 1996, by the way, said, if Saddam Hussein did not exist... We would have to invent him. He Mm. is the linchpin of our foreign policy in the Middle East. Uh, Yeah, by the way. But anyway, here he is. He says, um, in the Clinton administration, and presumably up till this day, the policy is we have to keep at least 100,000 troops in Northeast Asia. And he worried that if the U.S. military alliance with South Korea is de-emphasized, the U.S. would, quote, fall below that threshold. So... Um, And then the other ones are more explicit references to China. So we it's better without question, apparently, it's better to have brinksmanship and possible nuclear war uh, between North and South Korea and including the United States there in order to have an excuse, basically, a so-called reason just to keep our troops there and just to have an excuse for our ships around and just as a threat to hold over the head of our allies in the South and in Japan 
and really all is an excuse so that we can stare down China. Yeah, you know, it sounds very cynical, doesn't it? But it's absolutely true. There's no question in my mind that that is precisely what has been going on and why the uh, foreign policy establishment is so upset about this agreement. Uh, they cannot uh, uh, abide the idea that the United States would pull out militarily from South Korea, even if, in fact, it is in the context of a real peace between North and South Korea, with the North and South themselves disarming, uh, at least partially, and, and uh, basically carrying out a series of reassuring steps on both sides of the 38th parallel. They do not want that to happen. And the reason, as you've suggested, uh, as, as you indicated from the quotes that you read, is that, that this would mean that the United States will be symbolically uh, withdrawing from its position of being ready to go to war in Northeast Asia. And uh, that that uh, that this would be a sign that the United States is willing to accept a retreat from the entire Northeast Asian region. So what they want is to keep those troops in South Korea, uh, even if it means continuing uh, a situation, as you've uh, per, uh, just just said, uh, even if it means to keep a situation where war has to be a constant threat between the United States and North Korea. Uh, uh, that is preferable in their mind to moving towards a peace uh, situation in the, uh, in the Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. which would endanger the thrust of the Obama administration and the, the Pentagon in the Trump administration as well to move toward a higher level of confrontation with China. Now, you know, I have to tell you that uh, the linkage between these two things is very strong in the minds of some of these people, as, as Ian Bremmer indicated in his interview. And I believe that uh, this, there's going to be more to be uh, heard and seen about that linkage. And I think uh, I'm going to predict that uh, it's very possible, if not likely, that our present Secretary of Defense may depart because he is wedded uh, very strongly to that uh, posture, to that policy. Mm. And I don't think Trump is going to abide it. Well, you know, I was going to ask you, who in American power politics is for this at all? I mean, the fact that he's got Pompeo going along with him, that's just particularly as thanks for the job. I'm willing to go along with you, even on peace with North Korea, when every other part of his part of the right would reject that, right? That's absolutely right. It's, it's true that Pompeo made a choice to go with Trump in a situation where it involved negotiating with North Korea, and he's thrown himself into it, apparently, with great gusto. I mean, <laughs> and, yeah, uh, apparently he's reported back to the boss that, yes, this can work. Let's do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's right. And uh, so it's a very interesting case study in, in somebody who's made a leap from— But wait, so there's no go. major think tank that's not— that you can't find oil or banking or guns or Israel or any <laughs> the NRA or the AARP or any power faction in America that's pushing for peace with Korea. It's just Trump and a couple of his guys and not even his secretary of defense, you're saying? That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty accurate. <laughs> hmm. Hey, Gareth, one more thing real quick here. Uh, did you see that these Democrats? Oh, it's in your article here. Tammy Duckworth. And Chris Murphy, they introduced this bill. I love the way you put it here. I think this is the way they put it, that it would forbid Trump from pulling the troops out of South Korea, even as part of a peace deal with the North and a nuclear disarmament deal with them, uh, unless the Pentagon approves. <laughs> Well, they're right. going to have a committee of generals are going to decide whether the president can order the troops to move. Yeah, that's sweet. That's that's a sweet one, isn't it? I mean, uh, I mean, that's. That's kind of a desperation pass, I think, from from people who are a bit disoriented by Trump's success and who are got their heads together and said, what can we do? And that's all they could come up with, which is pretty lame. Let's face it. Well, and shame on Tammy Duckworth, who should be using her military, you know, disabled veteran status to push for peace all the time and shout down those warmongers who claim to know better than her and instead just look at her up there doing her best Hillary Clinton. It is a shame, and, and I must say it's another one of those signals that 
we're we're looking at a very uh, tumult, tumultuous period here as Trump and Kim uh, negotiate on a on a deal, a deal that is uh, very uh, big, looms very big in American politics as well as in the future of of U.S. foreign policy generally. Uh, and and uh, I think the Democrats are. Uh, are going to be uh, hard put to to uh, go along with this without uh, feeling like they're sacrificing politically. So I, I just think we're in for a very rough ride. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the Democratic base doesn't want to hear a bunch of militarist stuff like this just because MSNBC says so. That's not really how they feel. And I think that there's a great advantage there. And and it means we have to figure out a way to give Trump a Scooby snack here and do a kind of classical conditioning that this is what we like. TV might like it when you bomb Damascus, but what the people like is when you make peace deals. Well, you're right, of course. And, and I think that is the way in which this can be balanced off to the extent that public opinion, you know, continues to support this and even strengthens that support. That is going to make a difference. And perhaps that can save us from the clutches of this coalition that uh, so badly wants to maintain the status quo. All right. Well, uh, in case anybody doesn't already know, the single best article, of course, about why this is all George W. Bush's fault in the first place is by Gareth as well. And so you just search Gareth Porter Cheney, North Korea, nuclear weapons. It'll come right up for you there. It's from Truth Out again. And uh, that one's from a few months back. And this one, very important, at antiwar.com, originally running at consortiumnews.com, an elite coalition emerges against a Trump-Kim agreement. Thanks again, Gareth. Thanks so much, Scott. Very good to be on. All right, you guys, and that's the show. You know me, scotthorton.org, youtube.com slash scotthortonshow, libertarianinstitute.org, and uh, buy my book, and it's now available in audiobook as well, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. Hey, it's endorsed by Ron Paul and Daniel Ellsberg and Stephen Walt and Peter Van Buren and Matthew Ho and Daniel Davis and Anand Gopal and Patrick Coburn. And Eric Margulies, you'll like it. Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And uh, follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks, guys.